Technical Group. Today we have guests from Geno, from Norway Breeding Company, and our speaker Howard. He is a Chief Technology and Innovations Officer at Geno. So, Howard, please. Thank you. Um, and thank you so much for the invitation. And I'm looking forward to this presentation and, and discussion. And we will just start from here. Page down, maybe. I'll unmute this. Okay, so you're scientists, and a lot of most of you, I guess, are working with with the prediction. And I'm quite fascinated by prediction as a phenomenon. I think society has been fascinated by this. People who master predictions and forecast things have had a big position in a local society in history. We can go back to the time of old tribes and Kevin could read the stars or look into the glass bowl and, and see the future. They, they had a strong position. Uh, maybe I don't have so much respect for that technology anymore. We have moved a bit further, but uh, in the last modern times, I, I've pasted in a picture of Henderson and I think he achieved quite good results. We're still using his way of predicting breeding values. We put a bit of genomics into his equations, but it's still the same principle. Um, also, I just want to point out behind there it says uh, uh, multivariate calibration. And when I was a student, I did just, I, I, it's kind of funny, but I was interested in chemistry and the chemistry lab responsible person at the Department of Animal Science that was, he introduced me to multivariate calibration. He didn't know this much himself, but he said, oh, it's this course going on. And it's so, so I joined there and I learned a little bit about the multivariate techniques and it was developed uh, two Norwegian guys who worked at Mart for which is the uh, Institute of Food Science. And they kind of trained the whole group there quite early on multivariate statistics. And that was really fascinating. Predictions based on just utilizing lots of information, correlated information, spectral database. And then, of course, we have now reached an area of, of machine learning is coming more and more. I have never done this, but there are colleagues in my group who can, can and, and they utilize this for different purposes. And, and I think we have a pretty pragmatic approach. We want to predict something, and then we just try different tools. We do validation, and when we validate, we find out what's the best method, what's the best model, and we have Sometimes it's machine learning, sometimes it's a maximum of equations, sometimes it's uh, just a multivariate regression, it could be anything. So just to put it in perspective, this is what we're all working on. And, and I think we should be proud to work in this field. Yep. Um, so a short introduction to, to um, the Norwegian Red breeding. And maybe not all of you know the Norwegian Red population, but it's, it's um, been developed throughout the years um, in Norway, merging all the old breeds, adding Ayrshire from, from other Nordic countries. And, and uh, we have bred for, for especially fertility and health traits. So that's kind of what we are unique. And it's owned by Geno, it's owned by 7,000 dairy farms. Um, and we also sell the genetics in international markets. Um, so we are maybe a small population compared to, to modern Holstein and Jersey, but we think we are still relevant that we, because we are a bit different. And this difference may have been introduced back in the 70s. It was a big discussion in Norway about this, but someone came up with the idea that we should record every health 
incident. Every treatment of every single animal should be recorded in the health card. And there was some opposition, some heavy discussion, but they actually decided it was an agreement with uh, the authorities, veterinarians, uh, Geno, uh, or uh, the farmers represented by Geno and the dairy company. They all agreed this is what we should do. And this, I think, process is what quite often describes what I think about as a breeding success. You unite forces. Everybody's working in the same direction. So the whole business agreed this is what we should do. It was established. So from 1975 until today, every single health treatment of every single dairy cow in Norway is recorded on a health card. And now it's digitalized, of course, with unique health codes indicating what kind of disease has been treated for, the date, the ID of the animal, everything. So that's quite unique. And it has given us the opportunity to breed for health trades for quite some time. Um, and when you look at this is then typically the national figures and, and of course it's a mix of management and genetics, but I think it's a lot of genetics behind this because I would say Norwegian management doesn't differentiate hugely. Uh, so um, the cows that are not treated for clinical mastitis, that's about 90%. Not treated for ketosis, more than 98%. Not treated for milk fever, 97%. So, so the health incidents are now very low, which makes it at the moment a little bit hard to breed for because low frequency, it's a trait which is zero or one, and we put it into mixed model equation and we assume normal distribution and all these things. It, it behaves a little bit bad in that sense, but it's really good results. Uh, Fertility, non-return rate, 56 days, 73 percent. That's also quite extraordinary, I think, compared to a lot of other countries. Um, another thing which is unique for the Norwegian genetic is you now the level of polled genetics, and I'll come back to that. Quickly about the history. The uh, Norwegian genetic was established as a organization and a philosophy in 1935. You had the old Norwegian breeds. Each valley had, had its own breed. And then they started uh, approaching the breeding from a more scientific and advanced level and gradually progeny testing and uh, we blood breeding values. And we went into genomic selection in 2016, maybe a little bit later than others. We did pre-selection a few years earlier, but when we did the full transition. Um, and we went to a single step approach, while most dairy companies had the two-step approach. And then with genomic selection, all of a sudden embryo production was a really powerful tool in the breeding. And then after this, we thought, okay, uh, with genomic selection to have really good phenotypes is powerful. So we thought, what's the next phenotypes to focus on? And then media information and feed intake has been what we have invested in recently. And we're building resources. We are at a very early stage, but we think this will be a key thing in the future. And I would say cost-wise, this was impossible with approaching testing feed efficiency. If you take the cost of, of each phenotype, and you think about the old system, maybe you're testing 150 bulls, each bull should have 200 or 100, a minimum 100 daughters. This becomes so expensive, it's just out of range. With genomic selection, it is possible to utilize information differently, and it becomes much more interesting. And this has been now proven and worked on with the simulation work in collaboration with Gregor and now um, Melissa and the team here. Okay, a little bit about um, um, sustainable breeding. I think that's about breeding goals and where you want to go. But it also, if the population is too small and the genetic gain isn't strong enough, 
it will never be sustainable because your product will not be relevant in the market. Nobody will want your genetics because it's not strong enough. So it needs you need to have a certain dimension on your breeding. Here's a genetic trend uh, development, which is, you know, I think across species, pig breeding, dairy cattle breeding, everyone is showing an acceleration now with the introduction of genomic selection. But it, it has come in several stages. So this is the old protein testing period here in blue. Uh, and then we started breed selecting young test bulls based on some early genomic predictions. They were not really amazing, but they were better than nothing. So that gave us a little bit of increase in the orange uh, part of the graph. And then February 2016, we did the full transition. And it just continued to accelerate. At the time we had, I think it was between 16 and 18,000 genotypes when we did the introduction, which is not a lot, but it was proven bulls mainly, lots of them. And, and uh, that was quite powerful animals to have in the reference and quite good population structure. Um, and that, that means that it's a very high proportion of artificial insemination. It's the every herd is using the same size risk connectedness script. So that I think affects the value of your reference. Um, and then we've done stepwise improvements here, and we've gradually increased. We had introduction of embryo production, and we know up to the five index points compared to 1.5 in the old days. So it has really accelerated. And just to try to compare, levels are difficult to compare because you need specific trials for that. But genetic gain is easier. You have integral results. You, you get some information, you use some rules overseas. And a colleague of us, Gary Rogers, in effect, he has taken US data and had two different methods to, to try to express for genetic trend on pounds of protein on the US scale. And you say they give a little bit different results, the red and the orange line, and then he's comparing it to the black Holstein line and the green Jersey line. And then he's just starting and he has set 2016 to zero. So it doesn't say anything about levels, but just about the gain we are achieving. And I think US Holstein is, is a good benchmark because we know that they are, have been successful and they are kind of world leading in lots of ways. Then I'll say something about the pole genetic, which I said was unique or, or where we have a strong position compared to a lot of other population. And it was discovered quite a few decades ago, the, the first um, the first pulled bull. And we have been taking it's taken a long time. It's probably you now 40, 50 years ago. Uh, and you, you see that LA frequency has grown, and I've been really frustrated that we had such a low progress for quite some time. But the advantage is we're breaking up the pole phenotypes. There are crossovers, so we get lots of different haplotypes carrying the pole gene, which makes when we accelerate now, we have a lot of different families carrying the gene, and we don't run into inbreeding problem as badly as if we went very quickly from zero to 100. And I'll, I'll come back to that. And back to the prediction thing. Um, on in our team has developed a machine learning algorithm for prediction of whole genotypes on um, genotype animals. So he's just using information about dehorning in the national herd recording, about ancestors, about genomics. He's just adding all information into his machine learning. And he managed to differentiate the heterozygous and the homozygous polled animals which phenotypically are similar, but that helps. So if we give a bit of extra uh, token merit index for the ones carrying two copies rather than one. Um, here, I'll show you a bit about the chromosome one. Um, and at the very beginning of the chromosome one, we have 
the whole gene. And here we've taken, Anna gave me the information on all the homozygous pulp animals. And I was curious, are they homozygous all over the chromosome? Or, or what does it look like? And I think this graph shows you what happens when you're patient and you increase frequency slowly. You get crossovers. So homozygosity drops as soon as you get out on the flanks of the, the poultry, it drops. And you, it's a very good indicator to avoid that we avoid inbreeding uh, too much. And I'm just, this is just me playing. Uh, so this is not real data, but this is how I would imagine it would have looked like if we had gone too fast. We would have a very high level of hom homozygosity all over chromosome one, and it would have prevented us from future progress if there are other QTLs for other traits on this chromosome. And then we are not there yet, but I think gene editing has some potential in this way. We can fixate single genes if we do gene editing on each family that you want to bring forward in your nucleus breeding. Then you can make sure that everything else is you know, only altered the, the gene of interest, and you can avoid this. However, if you use gene editing the wrong way and you just do one or two animals, and this is going to be the, the founders of, of the future, it will all of a sudden be the red uh, line. But used in the right way, I think this is a bit interesting. Uh, a bit about lethal recessives. We have them and we, we discover new ones every now and then, but I, I hope we have found most of the important ones, but maybe we still have some, some unknown low frequency ones. So these are three, uh, three genes. AH1 is causing the Pym syndrome. I'm going to illustrate with some pictures. Or mortality is the mix. But if they survive, they look a bit like this. They are not functioning well. They're struggling to, to understand how to get the food that grow very So quite often they're called. And then you have BTA12, the, the fertility deletion, uh, embryo death. And BTA8 works much in the same way. And we have managed to reduce the frequency down to about 2%. And I think at 2%, of course, if by random mating, it will be 2% to the power of 2, which is a pretty small number. So it's not really a dangerous and bad thing. When farmers genotype their animals, we have a mating plan that makes sure that they don't get mated to bulls that are carriers. But we don't have a restriction saying we cull all carriers. So we could select carriers if they're good enough for other traits. Inbreeding trend for Norwegian men. Um, it's recommended that we stay, or breeding companies should stay between 0.5 and 1%. And I think we're quite safe. We're per generation, we're at the level of 0.15. So, so you're quite in the safe zone. Um, an effective population size 288. And we've worked a bit with genomic inbreeding as heterocytosity and, um, or the other way around, homozygosity. And the more genotype we animals, it starts to follow the pattern that we see from the pedigree based inbreeding. Okay, and then a bit about how the breeding is organized. Uh, with genomic selection, of course, the genomic resources is a key, that's a key thing. And I said we started with 16 to 18,000 genotypes when we did the transition in 2016, and we have gradually grown from there. So now it's more than 200,000 genotypes. However, some of these are young animals still waiting to have phenotypes. So I would say reference for, for instance, no kill, I'm guessing we could probably verify this quite quickly, but say roughly 80,000 um, animals with phenotypes and genotypes. And it's really, it's really helping for accuracy. Uh, the strategy now is to genotype roughly 35,000 animals per year. And we do 8,000 bull calves uh, where we look for the best 
dams and we genotype them and hopefully we find some good ones. We also have an embryo program, so we do 6,000 hectocarps, but that's in addition to those 21,000 carbs and hectares that the farmers do. And I would say roughly 6,000 out of those 21,000 are young enough for us to select embryos as well. So the pool for, for embryo selection is roughly 12,000 hectocarps. 6,000 that we initiate, 6,000 times. And then they do all the cups of birth that they use. And then sequencing strategies. Um, we have decided to continue. We, we had a precision breeding program. We called it a research pro project. And we did some sequencing there. And then we, we saw that was really useful. We were part of the thousand Bold project. Um, but after this, we have decided that this is not a project, it's just a routine thing. We do sequence all or lethals every year, a uh, little less than 50. And all in all, we are now having close to 750 sequenced bulls. And uh, the coverage is gradually growing as prices are being lower and lower. So this has been really helpful for us for several purposes, finding single genes, GWAS analysis, uh, et cetera. So we are using single step genomic selection while a lot of others are doing two step, but I think a lot of companies are playing with single step now and, and there's a transition, but we have learned quite a bit. We, we had bias issues at the beginning, uh, well, not really at the beginning, but after some time, at the beginning, it looked promising and gradually we saw that inflation and level bias grew. We ran the breeding values every two weeks and every time it looked worse and worse and we were really stressed for a few months and we thought maybe it's wool in the mixed models and, and we spoke to Tim Wevesen who is sitting in Norway and being a good resource for us. We spoke to Ignacy Mistal who is he, he was playing with some correction parameters into the mixed models. T wasn't happy about this because we were messing with Henderson's equation. Um, and then we went to the imputation part, which we had outsourced. And we kind of took ownership to it and we discovered that we did poor imputation. So when we got the imputation working well, we filtered out some SNPs that behaved badly. And it solved almost all the bias issues. And this is an interesting learning thing for us. It's not necessarily in the mixed model equation. A lot of it is quality of genotype. And this is actually something that I spoke to John Hickey about at the conference some years ago. And he said, oh, you've got to start with the whole genotyping process from the tissues you're sampling. Is it high quality tissues? Are they treated nicely? Are they genotyped well? So it shows he, he that was actually correct. Uh, so can, can I ask what was the problem with the imputation? We just did a really bad job. We didn't impute properly. So so then there were lots of errors in in the genotypes. Because the reference population was not a good one, or not necessarily. It was about just the quality of the genotypes entering. And, but it was where we had genetic trend. That's where we saw the, the bias. Uh, yes. So then maybe I could just get uh, answer this later. Um, so the main problem is uh, the quality of the genotypes are not the best. So we can not uh, regard them you know, the, as per se they are correct. So uh, there can be issues in the lab. For example, we were working with the lab that was having um, problems with the too high temperature in the lab. And that's why they're producing lots of SNPs with wrong results. And uh, we needed to do a proper quality check, filtering out all the SNPs that were uh, wrongly read. And after this correction, uh, things just uh, improved way, way more. Okay. So, so it was not the reference, it was your target, the, the, the genotyping of your population. Yes. Okay. And, and I've also seen that on raw genotypes, it's a very strong correlation between missingness and heterozygosity. And I don't believe that heterozygous animals 
should have more missing SNPs than others. That's not logic. But I think the heterozygous solutions there are because the missingness is an indicator of the general quality of the other SNPs as well. So when you have high degrees of missingness, there's a, there are a lot of SNPs uh, where qualities are just on the threshold for what's acceptable, and they are sometimes regarded as heterozygous when they should be homozygous. So then when you look at imputed, if they're properly imputed and filtered, then this correlation isn't so strong. So, no. Um, as I said, we have more than 200,000 um, genotyped animals. And um, for instance, in, in um, for the milk models, there are 5 million animals with phenotypes in the system. We're going utilizing data from 1978. That's the oldest one. So it's just the sum of everything. Uh, and pedigree goes as far back as 1920, 1930. That sounds impressive. I must say, I'm not really happy. I, I would like in the future for us to filter out. I'm thinking gene type goes back now to 1970-something. But be, uh, beyond that, we don't have control. And if you take a uh, probability of error, we have, I think it's 3.5% pedigree errors, Janus, roughly. Yeah. Something like this. But if you take one minus 3.5% to the power of number of generations back to the 1920s, you're starting to mess up things probably at some stage. So in my mind, we should we haven't prioritized it yet, but but I, I don't think that's a should be something to aim for. I think we should cut the pedigree at some stage. And much, much more recent than that. Uh, we discussed Van der Raden 1 and Van der Raden 2 methods. We ended up with Van der Raden 1, but we did a little, uh, we, we played with this for quite some time and we decided to use Van der Raden 1, but we forced allele frequencies to be set to 0.5. In that case, I guess it doesn't really matter if it's found on one or two, because you're manipulating this. The reason was we had a few uh, imported uh, bulls, and they could have SNPs that variants that, that have a certain frequency in the Norwegian population. And if they were really rare, you would put think that okay they must be closely related because they're sharing something rare so in the norwegian population they look very related and they had very high relationship coefficients in between themselves and they looked a little bit inbred however they came from a population where these alleles were very common so it was a completely false assumption they weren't very inbred and they weren't very closely related so that's when we forced uh, the MUF to be 0.5, then we solve these issues. So if you have a closed population, I think just plain on the one is good. When you have a population where you have different sources, I think it's a good idea to consider these. Things. I should hurry up a bit, Jans. Yeah. Uh, weight on the A matrix, 10% for the moment. I don't think it's really critical whether it's 5%, 10%, 15%. It should be a small percent. But the important thing is put a little bit of weight on the energy. Uh, and then we, we add a small value. You can do that uh, to the diagonal elements. But if this, we, we did a mistake at one stage where we added too much value. That was a decimal point ever when we did the coding. And this creates bias, so so as small as possible. Um, we have discussed imputation quality and these things. Uh, also, call rate, high missingness is not a good it's an indicator of something not being high quality. Uh, and then we are constantly checking level bias and inflation. And then we have uh, applied for the research council, Norwegian research council for a project, money for a uh, project that we do uh, with uh, the university at all with, with uh, PMO and Tesfaye um, 
I'm struggling with the surname always. Um, and Ismo Strandén from Luke in Finland is also part of the project. And Janus is the project manager. And for the moment, we are working with the top line here. We will hit the wall when it comes to memory very quickly during 2023. So we are now testing different methods. So Janus is, is um, starting uh, on the real reading value estimation to test out um, the methods. And, and this will be absolutely necessary for us to continue in the future. Otherwise, we'll have to buy tremendous amounts of, of memory, which is expensive. Uh, we have played with a J factor that's um, especially related to genetic groups, but just a plain J factor is, is describing how related an animal is to other genotyped animals. If you think about a genotyped animal, it doesn't really need a genetic group because the allele frequency at the base population has evolved and this is picked up by the genotype. But if an animal isn't genotyped, you want to put it in a genetic group. But if it has 100 offspring that are genotyped, for instance, then it becomes kind of imputed in, the, in your system. So then it becomes kind of double counting your genetic groups because it's, it's as if it was genotyped. Uh, the J factor tells you how closely related it is to genotyped animals. So that you can think if the value is one, then, then it has tremendous amount of relatives that are genotyped pointing at it. So it becomes kind of imputed. Uh, if it has a long distance to genotyped animals, it will be zero. And you can use that as a regressor. You can multiply it by the, the genetic groups. So, so you get partly genetic group solutions pointing at this end. So we played with this, we played with meta um, so We have been working on, on the derosis correction. Uh, you have the crossbreeding between different populations, but also within the population, it's a huge variety of heterozygosity, and this plays an important role for quite a few traits. And then we worked on model development. Uh, quickly about, uh, or breeding value estimation process. We're just going to start quickly. We have yesterday imputation will start. It. As soon as the imputation is started, we will press the button and we automatically create the tables and the structures for all the traits we calculate breeding values for. And then we can just on the dashboard follow the development as it's working with with the iterations. And when everything is green and it's it's ready and we can do quality checks and approve. One of the quality checks we're doing is, is uh, monitoring level bias. Here's the difference between the animals uh, breeding levels um, after their genotype relative to the mid parent mean. And we want that to on average to, to alternate up and down around zero between plus minus half index point, which is pretty small. Uh, quickly about the selection scheme, we have a population of 200,000 cows, as it would say, and without sexed semen, which is coming now, but before this, 100,000 of each gender. And for the bull selection, um, all the dams of those 100,000 uh, bull cows, they're ranked by breeding value, and we say that, okay, the 8,000 best dams, we want to genotype the bulls, the bull calves. And then we do pre-selection of 150 bull calves into a station where we just keep them until they're old enough to go to AI production. And then we do the point selection step and we end up with a little less than 50 elite size per year. Uh, I think this is pretty strong selection. I've spoken to others from other breeding companies and and uh, yeah, it's it's I'm I'm lucky to see other breeding companies with as much as 8,000 gene type bull calves. They may exist, but, but I haven't spoken to them. However, sex semen is coming very quickly now. And this is all nice for the producers. Everyone's happy except me. Because this means I'm destroying this resource. 
this will be maybe 50,000. And they, their dance will be the first dance in each hood. So this is, we're shooting ourselves in the foot, unless we do this thing here. And we have, we are not quite there yet. We are in progress. So, but that's the target we want to reach, stretch it out towards 4,000 embryos. At the moment, we are not using sex Y cells because from my perspective, I want this little house that farmers put in embryos. They would like some embryo, some heifers as well because that's beneficial for them. But I think we need to investigate the possibilities of using sex semen and just getting blue crops there in the future. Yeah. Is the sex semen on the on the worst cows being used? You know, it does beef semen. Yeah. So sex semen is we, we call it Redex, the, the Norwegian red product. And that's to get the heifer calves and they use it on the best females in the herd. And then they use beef semen on the worst cows. And this has taken a next step now where they use Y cells for beef semen to get bull calves. And where are they getting that semen? Clearly not from uh, the beef semen. We, we have a beef... Uh, breeding company in Norway, Thank you. but uh, yeah, so so we can can have some there, but also for some breeds we import, uh, but we would like to to be the importer and to distribute it. We don't want to give this away to a competitor. Yeah. A little bit about the accuracy, it started off being a little bit more than 0.6 when we introduced this is for for milk uh, milk use. a bit more than 0.6 in 2016 when we introduced it the data warehouse was established a little later so i it's a little doesn't start until 2017 and then you see the inflation period wasn't quite good we fixed things and then it grew and this is very much a function of the genotyping that we see but it will, the genotyping will, looks like it's going to grow linearly. This, of course, will go asymptotically. And we are now at the level of 0.8 something for milk traits. And I think that's really, that's really promising. We will never have the volume at the reference like uh, US Post and is reporting. But I think the difference will be smaller and smaller because they can not pass 1.0 either. So so the difference will shrink. Here you have some validation breeding values for from the young genomic sires on the x-axis and then what they have when they are proven on the y-axis. And you see the uh, accuracy levels of 0.8 for both kilograms milk, it's in region that it's 50 to 30, uh, protein percent, fat percent, and cell count. So it behaves quite nicely. Um, and um, just to, to compare, so I'm, I'm trying to, to say to a farmer, if you can look at your cow, the accuracy will be similar to having a bull with 30 to 40 daughters with phenotypes, which is it's, it's not 1.0, but it's, yeah, it's, it's quite good, I think. Generation uh, interval. This is something that everyone can show graphs like this. This has changed completely. I know we have stabilized here, but we're still using this as kind of targeting monitoring. So we want to reduce this even further. I think the dams of dams will go down as a consequence of sex semen. People will more and more use sex semen on the youngest cows because they're the best ones in the herd. And then you get a selection which you haven't had before. So if you can compensate by, by good embryo bull production, we can maintain uh, the bull selection there. Uh, also, we need to just push the sires to get the semen as quickly as possible, get it out and to the herds as quickly as we can. Uh, and dams of sires, that's the embryo heifers. And we will try to harvest the embryos as early as we can. But of course, there are animal welfare issues. We can and do not want to push it uh, beyond what we think is okay from an animal welfare perspective. Then, feed efficiency. 
Um, we have invested a lot in this project. And we spoke a bit earlier this morning about it's either either or either you go all in or you don't when it comes to breeding. And, and it's a bit like this here as well. We thought to do it really small, we can't be bothered, so we must do it as much as we can afford. A thousand genotypes is still pretty small, but it's it's internationally quite substantial. CRV are the only ones I know that has a bigger system than us. Uh, for this, and uh, we have just completed installing them in the 14 birds, but we have had some some data, so we have some preliminary results. And and the simulations are really interesting, and in that it really depends on the correlation between other traits, how this will behave, and how it will work. Um, methane. <sighs> We started a little bit earlier. We invested in uh, green feeders from CLOC. Uh, and we have quite a bit of data just on, on methane in grams per day. But now we want to merge these projects. So we're moving all the methane, uh, the green feeders, to the feed efficiency hood so we can look at it in the same project. I think that will be very interesting. I think we'll just move on. The methane heritability is and for lactating cows. It depends a bit on the definition of heritability, but if you if you only look at additive permanent environment and error, it's 0.26. If you add in the HES, the, the third test A variance, it's 0.18. But I think if you're comparing heritabilities to other traits where you don't have test A models, for instance, then 0.26 makes a lot of sense to, to communicate, which is for us really good. It's, it's promising. It's higher than we we thought we would, would uh, get when we started the project. Uh, and then we have, before I go to dry matter, we also did very limited tests on the young bull station where we recruit our bulls. And young bulls between 11 and 12 months there we have heritability is roughly 20%. Uh, so for feed intake, for the moment, just dry matter intake, heritability is 0 0.34, 0 0.36 if we, depending on how we define it. Uh, but of course, it's a bit of standard uh, uh, error here, but, but it's really promising. Um, so we'll just keep calculating heritability as data are getting in to get more and more accurate results. But this is really promising. We we have feed analysis. So in the future, I would like to look at not only dry matter, but also energy efficiency, protein efficiency. A bit about uh, the importance of, of um, the trait. I think it's quite interesting to see here you have the, the best and the worst bull with daughters in these contract herds with feed uh, intake recordings. And the difference economically with feed costs is a bit more than 70 kronen. So I think uh, we could divide it by 10 to 12 kronen to get it in pounds. Uh, and if you look at the feed intake, it's almost 12 kroners, which is one pound roughly, a bit more than one pound maybe. Uh, so it's quite a substantial difference economically, and that's per day. So, so if you have a huge herd and, and uh, it, it adds up to quite a bit of money, 100 pounds per cow per year could be. Uh, the difference between the, the two daughters. But then again, we have not corrected for difference in milk production. It is as one got higher dry matter content of the milk than the other one, then the daughter should be allowed to eat it more. So I, I think this is not the best way of defining the trait. We need to work more on this. I think that was most of it. 
Thank you, Robert. <clears throat> this is really great just to have a presenter that can kind of show the whole overview of a plant breeding program, which is we rarely have opportunity to see. So yeah, uh, I would questions here and then online. Thank you all for that was a presentation. Just I have a question for the last slide. If if uh, if there's one pound per day you're saving, then you ended up with hundred per year. So can you cancel it for us? Uh, I think I, I heard it perfectly I reflected maybe the difference there. Uh, because the purple is a carrier here and the bottom is a the carrier there. So it's uh -huh. okay. Yeah. So yeah. So, so if I only looked at this, then then it's okay. it's more. Okay. But this one has an advantage in this direction. I I can talk quickly about the traits. South American index a bit similar, but the the, the bad feed intake, the expensive uh, feed cost will is the daughters are using quite a bit. That's um, one and a half standard deviation more milk. Meat traits, uh, the daughters are more have more muscle. And I think that's not an advantage for feed efficiency. You need to maintain muscle, which is the most expensive tissue to maintain. Um, so meat becomes kind of a paradox when it comes to meat because we have learned that. The combination of milk and, and meat production is the best way because you have two products to divide your methane production for. And that's true. But at the same time, cows that are very meaty, they need more feed. And methane is very much a function of how much you eat. So it, I think you need to balance this meat thing. It's nice to have enough meat to have a combined product so you don't need to cull the cows from as soon as they're born that's not a good thing but to overdo it you get very big meaty cows which are not the best for low meat intake. so that's interesting to, to just see and it could be interesting to see when you look at more animals correlations to to meat fertility it, the difference is the other round. This uh, the low uh, heat cost bull has much better fertility. I have no idea about the relevance, but maybe there's something about energy balance that the daughters have better energy balance. Maybe that's because they utilize better. Or, you know, that's speculations, but it, it's interesting to get answers to these questions when we continue the analysis. And then adult weight, um, the, the the bad bull is also a little bit heavier, so so that's it's more kilograms to to maintain. Yeah. So you mentioned that you guys were one of the first to to take into consideration health traits, and took over thirty years for everybody to catch up. Yeah. Is there anything now that differentiates you from other breeding companies? There is anything that you are identifying that might be important to the breeding program that you don't see we, competitors doing? When we look at interval results and we also look at trials or results from, from uh, customers internationally, we see that even though Holstein said, that, oh, we've solved the fertility issue. When I look at the graphs, I see they, they have not solved it. They have had a huge reduction but they have stabilized it, but they have not repaired. So when we have trials, we are way, way better on fertility. But of course, with, with milk production, we the crossbred animals have quite similar results to the Holsteins. In the past, a little bit behind, but the latest data we have received is quite equal on kilograms protein. But we have more percentage while the Holstein has more volume. Um, for health traits, we, we, it's not so many health traits recorded internationally, so it's a bit hard to compare, but we see, especially on cell count, that we have quite a big advantage. Um, so we maintain this difference still, but we, at the moment, we see that for Norwegian red, that at least the Norwegian farmers, if they see a bull that's amazing for mastitis and fertility, but he's 
pretty bad on the rest. That's not the kind of goal they're asking for because they think fertility and master, that's not a problem for me. I want good others. I want high production, high uh, percentage of protein and fat and these things. So that's why at the moment we are not putting huge weight on these traits because we're already at a high level. We want to maintain the level that we want to focus on what the Norwegian farmers are finding the most challenging at the moment. So, but, but I hope that these traits will, will put us on the map. Others are doing the same things or, or, or developing these indexes, but we have invested quite heavily in what we think is high quality phenotypes. And I see a lot of breeding companies marketing breeding values for these things. But if you start to dig behind the breeding values, they're using what, what traits that they believe is correlated and maybe lacking proof sometimes. And so it's a lot of marketing and sales at the moment. I hope that we can have substance behind the breeding values when we start to present some. So, uh, I, I see chat is clear. Does anybody from the online audience wants to ask a question? I think you can just either unmute yourself or please type in a chat and then I can read. Howard, what's the future of dairy breeds? This is a bit more general question. So we have Holstein, have Jersey, or the Central European Black Tea Simmental, Montbelliard, Norwegian Red. Are there any significant more? Let's say let there's five, yeah. seven. Yeah, I, I guess there are enough breeds, but but they need to to have different properties. And the way I see things is that. Jerseys have, have grown for some decades, but with animal welfare issues, especially related to culling of, of young calves, bull calves. Uh, we went, I went to Ireland last year and, and I spoke to farmers that said that uh, some of the dairy companies are not so happy with the Jersey influence in, in the crossbreds. They have host in Jersey crossbreds because of this customer perspective related to culling of, of the bulls. The same thing was happening. We went to New Zealand in the winter and, and uh, the government and Fonterra, the biggest dairy company there, are not happy with the culling of, of the bull calves. So they're talking about banning this culling until the age of some, some weeks. I can't remember the, the official. And then they got a, it's costs to keep a calf without any meat potential for such a long time. And then, then they're asking a bit more about meat. And then Norwegian Red is, is relevant. But I think, I think Jersey is not growing internationally at the moment. That's my impression. Um, Crossbreeding is growing. Um, but the question is what to cross with. And it's been a bit like a zoo. Any crossbred is a good crossbred. I believe additivity genetically is important. So I think it does It does matter what you cross with. Uh, fleck fee, or, or we call it milk cemental in Norway, but I guess that's very much the same as, as, um, as fleck fee. Uh, they have more muscle than Norwegian, but they're bigger, bigger animals. Um, in my mind, they, they have maybe in some markets potential, but when it comes to feed efficiency, for a lot of markets, they will be too big and too heavy and have too much maintenance costs. In my mind, brown Swiss is, it's a bigger cow with, it's kind of a, a whole stand with more dry matter in the mill. Um, so I'm a little curious about why brown Swiss, what's the advantage of brown Swiss relative to the whole thing, but, but of course dry matter is there, but but in size and shape, it's, yeah. But, it, but it's definitely culturally a market in, in Europe for, for the brown Swiss. And, and, and I think that will be like this in the future. And I must admit Montpellier, I have very little limited knowledge about Montpellier. I have hardly just seen a few crosses. So, so others would know more about the future Montpellier than, than me. Yeah, just continue the crossbreeding. So, what the farmer that cross, let's say they have a hosting and they cross with the 
in the region web. They get an F1 car that has certain properties. What do they do with the F1? Do they cross it back to the hosting or do they? Um, for most of them, they, they, they cross it to either of the two parent breeds. It depends a little bit if you then think, okay, I'm happy with my cross, but I want to strengthen milk production, then you return back to Holstein and, and then you return, you, you do six crossing from there. But if you say, I'm very happy with fertility and health and, and I want to do even more of that, then the F2 will be no return red once again. So, so I, I, I think that it's a, the rotational cost there is good. I think in the future, if we manage to get embryo production at a much lower cost, F1 embryos could be interesting, but we are absolutely not there yet. So that's way, way ahead. Um, but then a lot of farmers also do three-way crosses. In America, they call them hojos or whatever, the whole stand Jersey crosses. And it's like, what's the next step? And they're missing some things and no genetic could be, or is used quite a bit amongst them. But then they have to decide what they want in the future. In my mind, the three-way cross, it, it's starting to be complicated, especially herds, 10,000 animals or more. You've got to know which animals have which breed proportion and it becomes quite a, a mix. So I think it, it's complex for, for a lot of big herds to, to do this three-way cross. But if that's what they want, that's fine. But I would recommend simplifying the crossing. Uh, and for, so for European market and US market, it's a lot of this rotation of course. Uh, in New Zealand, Australia, it's like they, they have experience with some things and they've started using red breeds and they are really happy with this. And when we ask them, what do you see as your future plan? They just keep crossing red breeds, Norwegian red, into just gradually moving in this direction as long as they're happy. And as soon as they're unhappy, they will do something else. So that's not so much a rotation of course there. New Zealand's got a lot of Kiwi cross, which is this Jersey Holstein cross, but that's not a rotational Jersey Holstein. That's the Kiwi cross, the way I understand it, is, is established as a population by LIC, and they keep breeding the cross spreads further. Um, and it seems like they kind of got a bit stuck. The farmers are, I, we spoke to at least, maybe they're not representative of all the farms, but they were they were kind of yeah. What what do we do next? We it doesn't bring us much forward now. So it will be interesting to see. We we have to be honest and say globally we, we are small we are a small player, but that's also giving us possibilities for growth. So it will be interesting to see how this fits in different markets in the future. What I think is interesting is that it works in Nordic climate. Um, and also Ireland, UK, it works well. It's not always terribly warm here, not, not in Edinburgh today at least. Far from that. And, and we, got, we, we had really nice week the other week. And, and then I got a picture from home yesterday with more snow. So it was snow on the lawn and snow on the roads again. So that's very different from, from Texas. We've been in Israel, Australia where temperatures are way higher, but it seems like Norwegian Ed are coping well also in these conditions. And I've been asking myself, why do they cope well in such a variety of environments? But maybe the fertility and health breeding has bred for robustness. There's something with energy balance. Some, and when energy balance is poor, I think you're more sensitive to changes and extremes. So maybe there's something there, but again, that's not scientific, it's speculation. So. But it's interesting to see that they perform well in a variety of different climates and environments. Thank you, Howard. Uh, there is no questions online, so I would like to thank you one more time. Uh, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Yeah, thank you, Howard.